Alright, so let's explore a somewhat deep and somewhat difficult to answer question that scientists have been tackling for many, many decades. And here I'm talking about one of the most profound questions humanity has ever asked. How did life actually start on planet Earth? And even though for centuries this remained a philosophical speculation, in recent decades there's been a lot of scientific breakthrough that started to paint a remarkably coherent, although still somewhat incomplete, biological picture. And in this case it's something we now refer to as abiogenesis. The natural process by which life seems to arise from non-living matter that eventually evolved into organisms like us. But in today's video we're actually going to focus on some of the most incredible discoveries in just the last few months that potentially take us a little bit closer to figuring out how this initial process actually started. But obviously before we talk about all of this, let's briefly go through some of the important history just to connect the dots. And the story of course starts back in 1871, Charles Darwin. Darwin speculated about life originating in some kind of a warm little pond where a lot of simple chemical compounds would react and eventually form something much more complex that would then evolve into more complex organisms including animals. And for 19th century this was brilliant intuition. But unfortunately he had no idea how any of this would physically work. And that's until some of the first experiments in the 1950s. With by now the most famous experiment being the Miller-Urey experiment, where the scientists simulated conditions on early Earth by zapping mixtures of gases like methane, ammonia and water vapor with various electrical discharges essentially simulating primordial lightning. And here, even in this somewhat simple setup, they spontaneously produced amino acids, the fundamental blocks that we're all made out of. And there's been some additional discoveries about this experiment in just the last few years that you can learn more about in one of the videos in the description. Naturally, we've also discovered similar amino acids in various extraterrestrial sources like meteorites, which possibly suggests that this is some kind of a widespread phenomenon and in theory life could maybe start elsewhere. But here we come to the main challenge. Getting these basic chemical building blocks is one thing, but assembling them into a self-sustaining, self-repairing and self-reproducing system is a completely different thing. Here we need a system that's capable of metabolism, reproduction, evolution and possibly a few more features that we usually define as life. And so up until recently finding such a system and trying to explain it was of course somewhat challenging. But eventually biologists proposed an idea now referred to as RNA world hypothesis. The idea originally proposed by Alexander Rich in 1962 and the idea that suggested that it was very likely RNA or ribonucleic acids that were the primary genetic material and even catalysts for early life. And DNA very likely evolved afterwards for some of the more complex organisms. Now once again you can learn about this proposition and some of the discoveries in some of the previous videos in the description, but in essence because RNA is so incredibly versatile and is able to store genetic information just like DNA and is also able to form three-dimensional shapes, catalyze chemical reactions and even act as a primitive enzyme, hinted at RNA being one of the most important molecules in order to eventually evolve complex life. And especially because technically RNA can also replicate itself and even facilitate various biochemical processes without the need for proteins. So in other words, early life could have just started with these RNA molecules all over the place. And so far there's been a lot of evidence for this proposition, including inside our own cells. Even in our own cells, RNA still plays a very important role that's technically even more important than DNA itself. For example, most of the protein synthesis and most of the information transfer is done entirely by RNA. DNA in this case just acts as a kind of an informational repository. And so it's the RNA that does most of the other stuff. But even here there's something that's missing. So how exactly did RNA form and how did all of this start initially? And so even though the RNA world hypothesis provides us with a compelling framework for information and catalysis, it does not explain where a lot of energy for all of this came from. For example, what drove all of these reactions and how were these molecules able to do all of this without things like for example ATP or adenosine triphosphate that today pretty much all cells use for energy. And this is where we get our second and very brilliant proposition that's based on something even simpler, thioesters, with the idea known as the thioester world hypothesis, initially proposed by a Belgian scientist Christian de Duvet. 
and he essentially proposed that it was very likely thioesters, or chemical compounds containing sulfur, that were very likely originally used by various RNA molecules as the universal energy currency. And this was of course way before evolution of ATP that's used today by all life. And in general, a typical thioester looks something like this. There is an oxygen, there's a sulfur, and an attachment known as the organelle group that can actually become pretty complex. And these molecules are known to be pretty reactive and can also release energy. This is usually done when their bonds are broken, which in theory makes them the ideal candidate to fuel the formation of much more complex molecules. And more importantly, molecules like peptides, or the building blocks of RNA. And so in essence, Christian de Duve Imagine a kind of a primordial planet where thioesters power the chemical reactions necessary to build some of the first genetic material. But the challenge in this case was experimental evidence or demonstrating how such compounds could have accumulated in sufficient quantities under very specific primitive earth conditions. Which brings us to some of the newer studies you can find in the description and some truly groundbreaking work. And specifically this study from University College London led by the chemist Matthew Palmer. And this study presents us with a major breakthrough. Essentially, they found a way to bridge the RNA world hypothesis and thioester world hypothesis. To some extent explaining how the more primitive thioester molecules eventually resulted in slightly more complex RNA. So here's exactly what they achieved in this study. They managed to make amino acids and RNA spontaneously join together in conditions like just your regular water and in conditions involving neutral pH. In this case, this is mimicking conditions on early Earth approximately 4 billion years ago. And the key was the thioester. Their experiments showed that thioesters provide necessary energy for a lot of amino acids to activate and then bind to RNA. But much more crucially, they also demonstrated very specific amino acid thiols that then selectively reacted with certain RNA diols rather than creating indiscriminate reactions with other molecules. And it's the selectivity that's vital in this experiment. It basically suggests that in these conditions, very specific right connections could form preventing random non-functional peptide chains. Or just to rephrase this, this implied a kind of a guided selection that would then lead to specific molecules and very specific RNA chains. Which effectively suggested that RNA molecules could now begin to control protein synthesis. And here they were able to achieve various steps of this process and even control the synthesis of RNA in just irregular water conditions. And this process did not require any kind of an enzyme and was basically done through a simple chemical switch, specifically the thioester and thioacid activation that could then theoretically could lead to protein synthesis. Which is actually what you've seen right here. Amino acids are linked into peptides forming proteins, with all of this requiring nothing but water and thioester molecules. And this is a huge step for biochemistry and scientists trying to understand the origin of life. This is a direct experimental demonstration of a plausible pathway for what RNA very likely did early on and for how RNA molecules could have started synthesis of early proteins without ATP by just using this very simple molecule for energy. Which eventually, of course, would lead to all fundamental processes inside modern life. So this was definitely quite a brilliant experiment and quite a brilliant explanation. But this was not the only discovery from just the last few months, and we do have additional studies that explain this even further. And specifically because RNA still requires some kind of a container or something to bind itself in order to protect itself from the environment. And here we're talking about the concept of a protocell, something that was discussed a few years back in a study you see right here. And here we have another intriguing hypothesis the droplet world hypothesis, which would be essentially the next step in the evolution, with the main principle suggesting protocells which might have started as some kind of a droplet that eventually started to store all of these RNA molecules, allowing them to do all of their stuff inside instead of the outside. And here once again this connects to thioesters. Here researchers showed that they could use amino acid thioesters as prebiotic building blocks to create something much more complex, with their experiments showing that oligopeptides spontaneously formed very tiny soft spherical structures that scientists refer to as coesservate droplets through the process known as liquid-liquid phase separation. And what's even more remarkable is that these droplets were able to undergo a steady growth division cycle 
by periodically adding additional monomers, by essentially growing, and when subjected to any physical stress from the outside, they would then shear, dividing into new smaller droplets that would then grow again. So kind of mimicking reproduction. And this was experimentally demonstrated several times, with every division taking just a few hours. And so here they physically show that certain complex molecules, once again involving these thioesters, can actually start their own version of replication, and this is known as the autocatalytic self-reproduction. But crucially, these reproducing droplets could also take and concentrate a lot of additional important biological molecules, like the early RNA molecules and various lipids. And when RNA entered these droplets, they would tend to localize near the inner boundary, which actually surprisingly helped protect the droplet from being dissolved by various lipids. And so here there was already this very bizarre symbiotic-like relationship between the droplet and RNA, with a super cool system providing this very important missing link. The link between chemistry, simple chemistry, and the beginning of biology. This essentially provides us with direct experimental model for how these primordial environments could have potentially started early life. Perhaps inside various hot springs, perhaps in the depth of the oceans, near the hydrothermal vents, or maybe in certain types of lakes, containing just the right conditions. Now we still have no idea exactly where this would happen, but we kind of have experiments showing us that this is definitely possible. So essentially here it's definitely possible to recreate tiny self-reproducing droplets mimicking life itself. And all of this just required thioesters and RNA, in essence also confirming the ideas behind thioester world hypothesis and RNA world hypothesis. So definitely super cool stuff. But where does this leave us when it comes to the origin of life? Can we actually answer the question once and for all? Well, we're definitely seeing a lot of convergence of different ideas and different propositions, but the exact explanation is still missing. For example, here the RNA world hypothesis explains how genetic information and even catalysis could emerge, whereas the Thiwester world hypothesis provides a plausible energy source for some of these early reactions with this last experiment also showing us how early reproduction could have started as well. But despite these initial links and these initial connections, all of this is still a hypothesis. And it's very likely going to remain a hypothesis until we discover something very similar happening on another world. And so in other words, we do require some kind of an extraterrestrial life in order to confirm these ideas and in order to understand how life evolved on our own planet. But importantly, when it comes to biochemistry and microbiology, we are now definitely moving beyond just these isolated propositions into an era of integrated models where things slowly are starting to make a lot more sense. And this is not just philosophical anymore, it is supported by increasingly sophisticated experimental evidence where actual non-living chemicals seem to kind of sort of act like living cells, bringing us just a little bit closer to finally understanding how life began. And honestly, it's really studies like this that represents a true testament to the power of scientific inquiry. Because here, slowly but surely, after decades of research, we're piecing together all of the life's deepest mysteries, and we're slowly but surely getting closer and closer to the understanding of origin of life. And although we are pretty close, we're just not there yet. And so once we get there, or once we have some updates, we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, check out all the links in the description below, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.